Hi, good evening. Buenas tardes a todos. My name is Cynthia, and today we are here to share some scary stories from Latin America. The program is going to be bilingual, so if you would like to read the story um, in either English or Spanish, we are going to have the translations available on the YouTube description. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Cynthia. Ahora vamos a estar um, contándoles cuentos um, de miedo de Latinoamérica. Va a ser bilingüe el programa, así que si uh, prefieren leer el, la historia en un diferente idioma, lo pueden encontrar en la descripción del video de YouTube. Uh, conmigo ahora está aquí Sheridan, Luisa, Evelyn, Ana y Brian. Um, buenas tardes a todos. Voy a empezar yo con mi historia. So today I'm going to tell you about a scary story that is probably the first scary story that we all heard when we were growing up. It is definitely the first monster we all learn about and it's the story of El Cucuy. So El Cucuy, also known as El Coco or El Cuco, sometimes it is a female and it's called La Cuca, um, is similar to the boogeyman. And El Cucuy comes to either eat you or to kidnap you or steal you away um, when you misbehave and you don't listen to your parents. So he's kind of like your parents ally in that if you don't listen to them, El Cucuy is going to come and get you. And we even have a lullaby in Spanish that we sing to babies um, that goes, Duermete mi niño, duermete me ya, porque viene el coco y te comerá. So ever since um, we're babies, we are warned that if we don't fall asleep when we're supposed to, El Coco or El Cucuy is going to come and eat us. Um, nobody really knows what El Cucuy looks like. That's not the scary part of the story. Uh, the scary part is that he's going to eat you or he's going to kidnap you or he's going to take away your spirit. Um, and some people say that he hangs around in the rooftops, watching the children, seeing who's misbehaving. Um, so he looks like probably like a dark shadow in the night. Um, and yeah, so th that's the story our parents tell us so that we behave, so that we listen to them. Um, and I think every country has a version of this um, in every, all around the world. But El Cucuy is definitely one of the most famous ones. So I'm gonna go now and introduce Luisa. That's gonna, she's gonna tell us another scary story that our parents tell us to um, ask us to behave. Yes, hello, I'm Luisa, me llamo Luisa, and I'm going to tell this story um, the best I can in English, Spanglish, I'm going to call it. Uh, so, esta historia se llama El Pacto, and es un cuento que me contaba mi mamá uh, cuando era niña. So, this story uh, is a story that my mother used to tell me when I was little, about five or six as a warning to that I better act right or, well, you'll see. Okay, so El Pacto. This is a story about two friends. There are two men in their kind of midlife, around their 30s or so, and they love La Mala Vida. So they love to drink and gamble and, well, as you can imagine, all the things that go along with that kind of lifestyle. So they, one day they were doing their usual at the local bar in town, drinking, gambling, talking um, all, about all kinds of stuff. And they were pretty far in their drinks um, and they started to wonder um, what happens after you die. So Lupe, it's Lupe and Jose. So Lupe asks Jose, hey, do you think there's a heaven and a hell? And Jose says, well, if there is, we're definitely going to hell because you know how we've been doing. And he's like, you're right. Oh, and then Jose says, hey, what do you say we make a pact that whichever one of us dies first, we'll come back and we'll tell the other one whether or not hell is real. And so Lupe thinks about it and he's like, yeah, sure, why not? And so they shake on it. Well, and they continue, you know, having a good time, getting their drinks, laughing it up. Um, then the night comes to a close. They're pretty drunk at this point. So they say goodbye and they stumble each their own way home. 
Well, Jose goes down his usual path. Uh, he has to cross the train tracks. And because he's stumbling, being so drunk, he gets his foot stuck in the tracks. And he's there trying to get his foot out. He can't. He's drunk. He's losing his balance. He hurts himself. He falls. The train comes and wipes him out. And he dies. So the next day, Lupe finds out about Jose's death. And he gets really uh, impactado. He gets like startled, frightened, um, impacted by this news that of uh, the coincidence that Jose dies right after they make this pact. And so Lupe is terrified. He goes to church for the first time. He's, he's just like an anxious, frightened mess because he's afraid that his friend is going to come back and, and tell him something, you know, as a ghost or something. So he goes to church for the first time. He's just he's so scared. A few days pass. It's the third day. Lupe, he can't eat. He can't sleep. He's, he just can't take it anymore. And so that night he calls out to his friend. He says, Jose, yeah, dime. Es cierto. Is there heaven or hell? And then he hears a rustling outside his room. He approaches the window and he looks out the window. He gets near and all of a sudden he sees Jose's mangled, charred body press up on the windowsill and it says, it's true, it's verdad, hay un infierno. And that freaks Lupe out. He screams, a blood curdling scream. He then has a heart attack and dies from the fright. So then from that moment on, the people in the town uh, told this story to their children as a way to remind them that they need to behave themselves and act right and follow a, a righteous path because hell is real. And if they ever doubted, they would walk them past Lupe's house to show them the, bar, the burn marks of Jose's hands on the windowsill from his, his fiery visit from hell. The end. Wow, that, that was a scary story. <laughs> Now we're going to hear, yeah, thank you for sharing that, Luisa. Oh, you're welcome. Um, now we're going to hear from Sheridan. Uh, you ready, Sheridan? Yeah, yeah. Hi, everybody. My name is Sheridan. Um, I'm going to be telling you the story of La Mala Hora, uh, which is a legend from like the New Mexico area, um, South Texas, that whole area. Um, and so it's, um, the name means the evil hour. Uh, they also call it La Malogra or even the evil doer in English. Um, and so it's said to be this wicked spirit or like an evil demon uh, that wanders around roads and crossroads um, at night waiting for, you know, single travelers uh, to drive them insane or, or kill them. Um, in some places, it's even more feared than, than the devil. Um, especially since, you know, New Mexico, it's all desert landscape. And so these roads are in the middle of nowhere, long stretches with nothing in, you know, no towns or no people. Um, and so they say that first it appears as this like large black lump that people see. Then it's even darker than, than the night that surrounds it. So you see this large black lump and it can change shape and it can change size and it can get bigger and smaller depending on whatever it feels like you need at that moment. Um, they say that anybody who looks at it um, runs the risk of being driven insane. You know, you go crazy. Um, the word is loco. And that it tries to hypnotize and paralyze anybody that it comes into contact with. Um, some of the first accounts of La Malaora are accounts of, you know, lonely desert travelers who would be walking at night and they would be really cold. And so when they would come upon La Malaora, 
um, they would see like a poncho made of wool um, that they would say, oh man, I, I need to put that on, right? Because it's really cold. So they would put on the poncho para calentarse to get a little warmer. And then little by little, the poncho would get smaller and smaller and smaller. And they would try to take it off, but they couldn't. And before long, it would squeeze all the air out of their lungs and it would squeeze them to death. It would smother them um, and then it would disappear. And so in the morning, people would find a person dead by the side of the road, um, you know, death from asphyxiation. And they would talk about, oh, he must have come across la mala hora. Um, other times, it can actually change form and become a, a woman who's wearing all black, she's got glowing red eyes, long hair that's all unkempt, um, and really pale skin. One of the more famous stories that, that, that people tell um, is the story of a, a woman uh, whose husband was away on business. And so he was out of town um, and she didn't want to spend the night by herself, you know, in, in her house. So she decided that she was going to go visit one of her girlfriends, you know, and so she, um, who lived, you know, down the road. So she drives over and on the, on the way to her friend's house, um, she sees a large black lump in the road. And she thinks that it's a rock or a boulder or something. So she comes to a stop, you know, she presses the brakes. And when she looks back, she sees that it's gone. And then the next thing she hears is the sound of clawing at the window and she turns and there's a woman there with black hair and red eyes who's clawing at the window trying to get inside the car. So she hits the gas to, you know, get out of there. And as she's accelerating, the woman is running alongside the car, keeping up with the car. Um, eventually she manages to outrun the woman and as she looks in the rearview mirror, she sees that she left the woman behind, but the spirit is growing bigger and bigger and bigger in the rearview mirror as if it's like the size of a tree. So finally she gets to her friend's house, you know, she runs inside, she slams the door behind her, she's, you know, scared and panicking. And she tells the friend what she saw. And the friend says, oh, it must have been la mala hora. And they say that when she appears at a crossroads like that, and as a woman, it's an evil omen that somebody is going to die. And so, you know, she, you know, les sirve poquito tecito, she gives her some tea, you know, they start to try to calm down a little bit. And finally, you know, the, the, the lady didn't sleep at all that night. She was up all night just because she was so frightened from what she had seen. The next morning, she drives back home. And when she gets there, she finds a police car waiting in the driveway. And the police officer steps out of the car and lets her know that they got news that um, her husband was mugged the night, the night before um, while he was, you know, away, you know, out of town. And that the mugger, um, in order to get his wallet, shot him and killed him around the same time that she was driving to her friend's house. Um, and that's the story of La Mala Hora. So don't drive alone in New Mexico by yourself at night. Okay, now we're going to hear the story of La Llorona from Evelyn. Okay, so I'm gonna be talking about La Llorona. We're very lucky we have at the library also um, a picture book about the Llorona. So if you wanna check it out, make sure to do so. Um, but the La, La Llorona is also a very popular story. Um, there have been many films that have been made in regards to the story. And a lot of people say that the La Llorona is real, that people have seen La Llorona. Um, so let's get into it. Uh, La Llorona did start off in a small, quiet village where there's a beautiful girl named Maria. And Maria wasn't only the most beautiful girl in the village. She was the most beautiful girl in the whole world, they said. And this really um, had then got Maria to think of herself as beautiful and she didn't want anyone else to tell her otherwise. Um, she became very prideful. She thought she was better than everyone else. And a lot of the men from the village, they, they followed Maria. They wanted to make her th their wife and she didn't want any of them. And she thought to herself, I'm gonna marry the most handsome guy in the world. And one day, to the village came a very handsome ranchero on a high horse. He had gold, he was rich and wealthy, and all the other village girls, they were head over heels for him. They all wanted him. And Maria thought, 
I'm beautiful. He's handsome. I'm going to make him work for it. I'm not going to be head over heels like all these other girls. I'm going to ignore him, his serenades. And that's exactly what she did. He would serenade her outside um, her home and she wouldn't even look out the window. He would give her beautiful, expensive gifts. She would toss them, throw them in the river. And, and this worked actually. The ranchero was telling himself, I need Maria. I need to make her my wife. And he did eventually, she gave in and did make, and they were a husband and wife. And they had two kids later on. And everyone in the village thought they were happily married until this ranchero, after a couple years, he started leaving the village. Sometimes it was a couple days. Sometimes it was a couple months. And the only reason he would come back to the village was to see his kids, not even Maria. He would ignore her. He would go outside with the kids, leave Maria to do all the hard work, cleaning and feeding them. And so this really got Maria upset. Can you imagine? She's this beautiful girl and now she's being treated like less. And she was really upset at him. Um, one day she took the kids out to the river after a long day of them playing around and causing her havoc in their world. And there comes by the side, strolling in a carriage, her ranchero. She was in shock. And not only was he there by himself, he was there with a very beautiful woman. He was holding her hand. He was talking to her, touching her hair. And then he sees them and he bumps into his family, his wife and his children. And he's like talking to his kids. Oh, hi kids. Doesn't acknowledge Maria at all goes on. There had been rumors and, and Maria had heard them that possibly the ranchero had found another woman in another village and she didn't want to believe any of that. But this proved to be true. Now this woman had taken like her spot and she was very angry. She became so angry. They were still next to that river and all she could think of was the betrayal and all the anger and the jealousy that he was paying attention to her kids and not her. And out of all that anger, she grabbed her kids. She threw them in the river, being so mad, filled with all that anger. Um, she later realized what she had done and she sobbed and sobbed. There's different versions of what happened next. Some say that Maria went into the river trying to, trying to find her kids, but she went in so deep that she drowned. Another version says that she purposely drowned herself um, so that she could die too because she, she figured her children were gone. And so after that, the village found out what had happened. Um, they buried Maria in a beautiful white long gown and they buried her right next to the river. But they didn't know that when Maria went to the land of the dead to try to enter the land of the dead, she was denied entry. Um, she was banished back to purgatory on earth so that she could find her children. And until then, she would be allowed into the like, land of the dead. And so they heard the wind. The villagers started to hear the wind. Ooh, and they started to kind of hear in the wind something being said. And a lot of the villagers started to question themselves. Is that the wind? Is someone saying something? Um, but then one night a villager went by the river to get some water and he saw from afar, right where Maria was buried, he saw in the dark a white long gown standing around there and someone weeping and someone crying and saying, mis hijos, my children, and looking and looking for the, her children. And so a lot of the villagers told the children, don't go out at night because La Llorona is going to get you. She's going to mistake you for her children and take you to the land of the dead. And a lot of this was to teach the children, don't go out too late. Don't you know, stay out in the dark and be cautious of other people. And this is a story that's, you know, evolved and changed a lot throughout the years. Thank you. Okay, so now we're going to hear from Brian. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Brian. And today I'll be telling you guys the story of uh, La Ciguanaba. And although there's a lot of versions found throughout Latin America, um, the one that I saw pretty frequently was, um, it comes from El Salvador. So originally called Siwewet, 
which means beautiful woman. Um, she was a peasant girl and she had these dreams of like ascending. She hoped to ascend to become queen one day and using her charms and like literally a witch's brew, she lures Jason, who's um, this, the god of rain, Tlaloc's son. And she eventually marries him. But after marriage, um, Jason leaves for war. And while he's away at war, um, Siwewet begins to have an affair. And out of this affair, she gives birth to um, her son named El Cipitio. Um, but Siwewet, it turns out becoming like a terrible mother. She's famous for neglecting her son, often leaving him alone like to meet her lovers. And in the process, she devises like this plot to use this type of magic potion to kill Jason. So that way she can claim the throne for herself and for her lover. Um, ultimately, the plan ends up working. You know, Jason drinks the potion. He's transformed into this hideous monster who was ultimately killed by the palace guards. And when his father, Tlaloc, when he finds out about this, he curses and they condemn Siwewet. And she is now, she now adopts the name of La Siwanaba, which means hideous woman. Um, and part of her punishment was that although she was beautiful at first sight, she would turn into this like abomination after luring her victims near like isolated gorges or bodies of water, such as rivers. And she must, she's forced to wander the countryside and she will often appear to men who travel at night and is often seen washing clothes or like combing her hair. And similar to La Llorona, she's seen looking for her son. El Cipitio. Um, but since La Siguanaba must spend the rest of her days attempting to lure like unfaithful men, just midnight stragglers, you know, walking aimlessly throughout the night, um, they ultimately, they do make their way towards her because these men are often transfixed by her appearance and beauty. And once an individual approaches her, although she seems harmless, um, especially when they see someone just combing her hair, um, they unsuspectingly, the La Ciguanaba lunges towards them and she reveals the head of the horse. Um, this image often sends the man into shock. And there are two ways that I read about that oh, the man can like, release the grip from La Ciguanaba, either by biting down on a metal coin or their machetes, but they have to entrust both to God. And um, for the men who have lived to tell this tale, um, these are some of the testimonies that they've actually given, saying that when they were face to face with La Ciguanaba, that they were able to escape by biting down on their machetes and making the sign of a cross. Um, but yeah, I, I hope I don't run into La Ciguanaba ever. And I hope none of you guys do too. <laughs> Thank you. That was a good story. And actually, like Brian mentioned, um, La Ciguanaba had a child named El Cipitillo. El Cipitillo era el hijo ilegítimo de La Ciguanaba y el lucero de la mañana. Y... El esposo de la Ciguanaba, cuando se dio cuenta de que um, la Ciguanaba había tenido un hijo con, con su amante, los cero de la mañana, los condenó no solamente a la Ciguanaba, pero también al Cipitío. Y la condena de Cipitío fue de nunca crecer, se quedó de la edad de 10, 10 años um, siempre. Era cheparo, barrigón, siempre usaba un, un um, sombrero como de bruja y los pies al revés. Y hay muchas historias que hablan del cipitío, um, que hacía muchas travesuras, y los campesinos reportan ver 
la, los pasos, las huellas del cipitío en el campo, pero nunca lo pueden encontrar porque como sus pies están al revés, siempre al seguirlo van al lado contrario. Y hay muchas historias incluidas en el libro de, de cuentos um, salvadoreños, cuentos de cipotes de Salarrué, que es un libro clásico que habla um, de cuentos de niños y mencionan mucho las historias de las travesuras que hacía el cipitío. Entonces, no necesariamente, no todos son cuentos de miedo, pero sí el niño también fue condenado, igual que su mamá. Um, y ahora vamos a escuchar la historia de Ana, que nos va a contar la historia de la bailarina sin cabeza. Hi everyone, I'm Anna and I will be sharing the story of the big headed dancer, La Bailarina Sin Cabeza. I will be um, talking about the story in Spanish, so you can find the, the English version of it in the description of the video. Entonces, La Bailarina Sin Cabeza eh, toma lugar en los años 20, a finales de los años 20, en la época de la prohibición en Tijuana. Um, como estaba prohibición en Estados Unidos, la mayoría de los residentes del sur de California cruzan a Tijuana a este hermoso casino, ¿no? que es el casino de agua caliente, que pueden ver aquí atrás. Eh, increíbles lujos, iban a apostar, all the gambling, all the drinks, everything, you can imagine all the fun, toda la diversión que podían obtener ahí. Y parte del espectáculo de este casino, de la atracción de este casino, era una bailarina que se llamaba la, era, era nombrada la faraona. Esta bailarina española se especializaba en bailar flamenco y era muy famosa porque era muy hermosa además de ser muy talentosa. Pero no solo esto, sino que empieza a ganar fama porque todo el mundo se da cuenta que cuando la bailarina pasa a un lado de ellos, mientras apuestan, siempre ganan. Entonces empieza a cobrar esta fama de que si la bailarina está cerca de ti mientras tú estás apostando, empiezas a ganar. ¿Qué pasa? Que muchos hombres le empiezan a llamar y le dicen, siéntate aquí conmigo, apuestan y le empiezan a dar joyas. La bailarina empieza a crear un pequeño tesoro, empieza a guardar todas sus joyas y es, es muy sabido, ¿no? Que la bailarina este, tiene este tesoro, es bastante rica y continúa dando sus espectáculos. Tiempo después, la bailarina conoce a este hombre de, de, de Inglaterra, este Mr. Patrick, que, que aparentemente es un lord, ¿no? La enamora, tienen varios tiempos juntos y él siempre apuesta, obviamente, con la bailarina y empiezan a generar esta riqueza juntos. La, la bailarina le cuenta de su tesoro y él le dice, como, ¿qué tal si seguimos apostando, ganamos mucho más dinero y eventualmente te llevo conmigo a Inglaterra, ¿no? Nos casamos, vivimos felices para allá. La bailarina empieza a notar que Mr. Patrick es muy ambicioso y que solo le da vueltas a, a, al, al plan de irse a, a Inglaterra, pero realmente nunca pone en fecha, ¿no? Entonces empieza a sospechar y la bailarina es una persona muy lista. Llega el día en el que Patrick le dice, eh, te veo fuera del minarete. El minarete es una torre que todavía está en, en el casino de Agua Caliente, que ahora es una preparatoria, es high school en Tijuana. Es una torre muy alta, muy bonita. Entonces, Mr. Patrick le dice a la bailarina, te veo fuera de la torre del minarete en la noche, eh, trae el tesoro y ya vamos a empezar a planear todo, ¿no? Para irnos a Inglaterra, pero yo voy a, hacer cargo, a hacerme cargo del tesoro. Entonces, la bailarina sospecha y a la hora de la cita llega, pero no trae el tesoro. Obviamente, Mr. Patrick se enoja muchísimo, empiezan a forcejear, es una tarde muy lluviosa, nadie escucha los, la pelea ni el forcejeo de la bailarina porque siempre hay jazz, ¿no? Tocando al, este, en el casino y además de que, 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 el, que el ruido, ¿no? Del espectáculo. ¿Qué pasa? Que esta pelea sigue escalando y demás. Llega el punto en el que Mr. Patrick toma un cuchillo y le corta la cabeza a la bailarina. ¿Por qué? Porque nunca le dice dónde está el tesoro. Entonces, dice la leyenda que el tesoro sigue escondido eh, en, en el casino de Agua Caliente y la bailarina baila por toda esa zona eh, asegurándose de cuidarlo, ¿no? Esa noche la bailarina que, que, es asesin, que es asesinada, esa noche la bailarina tenía todavía un show al que tenía que asistir. Entonces dicen que la bailarina se presenta, da su show magnífico como siempre y al final al bajarse del escenario se quita la cabeza y se va con la cabeza a un costado. So now I wanted to share with you all that we have books and um, videos that you can check out from the library if you like these stories. Um, I have some here to show you. Do we have some for children, for adults in English and in Spanish? Um, we have for my story, El Cucuy. Está El Cucuy by John Hayes. Um, we also have these books by Claudia Galindo. Conoce El Cucuy. Um, do you know, oh, conoces El Cucuy? Do you know El Cucuy? And it's bedtime kukui, a la cama kukui. So these are definitely not scary stories. Um, and kukui looks, looks actually kind of friendly. 
uh, but those are for children. We also have a collection of DVDs. Uh, la serie de La Leyenda de la Nahuala, La Leyenda del Charro, La Leyenda de las Momias de Guanajuato, y La Leyenda del Chupacabras. So you can check these out from the library. We also have some for adults. I thought this one was really interesting because it's um, local folk tales, Mexican folk narrative from the Los Angeles area. And we also have these bilingual books um, that tell the stories completely in English and in Spanish. We have stories from Mexico, Historias de Mexico, and stories from Latin America, Historias de Latino America. Y Ana tiene también algunos libros para compartir con nosotros. If you're interested in a story similar to The Beheaded Dancer, si les interesa una historia parecida a La Bailarina Sin Cabeza, pueden encontrar algunas en este libro que se llama Leyendas de México. Y también pueden encontrar otras más en este que se llama Leyendas de Guanajuato, que son en específico a las regiones, ¿no? sobre todo rurales de México. Muchas gracias. We hope you enjoyed the stories today. You can find a list of all of the books and videos we recommended on the YouTube description as well. Um, and thank you so much. Bye, everybody.